This episode of Cello Chat is brought to you by Carriage House Violins of Johnson String Instrument. Please visit us at www.carriagehouseviolins.com. Okay, and we are live. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me here today in Cleveland, Ohio, on a beautiful but very windy day. Um, I'm here to talk to you about three-dimensional sound and musical gesture. And uh, it's important to understand the mechanics of how three-dimensional sound works and also to uh, how to use them to maximize uh, your, the depth of your musical expression, which is really the, the entire point of going to the trouble to make three-dimensional sound. But I thought, um, you know, if you walk away today getting nothing else, um, I want you to walk away thinking to never take anything for granted and to always ask questions. Uh, sometimes your teacher tells you something, perhaps they were wrong about something or you don't agree, or maybe you misunderstood what they said. It's so important just to always ask questions and to seek out answers for yourself. Um, and so I always like to start with definitions, like to define things, uh, because if we start with facts, it's a more secure place in which to begin. And so um, I wanted to just briefly talk about dimension in the physical world. So in the physical world, um, there is one dimensional, two dimensional and three dimensional things, um, or I shouldn't say things, but um, whatever you, you think, okay, good enough, <laughs> we'll call them things. Um, now, a one dimensional uh, in the Oxford Dictionary is described as a line or a line segment which has length but no other characteristics. Two dimensional uh, is defined by having or appearing to have length and breadth but no depth. And I found it very interesting that another possible definition for two dimensional is something that's uh, lacking depth or substance or being superficial. And that we'll, we'll come back to later. Now, when we talk about three-dimensional, of course, that's going to be having or appearing to have length, width, and depth. And of course, we live in a 3D world. Everything you see around you is three-dimensional. And sound itself is three-dimensional. So um, that's already uh, a big push to, uh, to make three-dimensional sound. Um, now let's look at dimension in the world of music. Now, if we applied what we know from physics to um, music making, um, probably one dimensional a line would be something like a note with no inflection like this. Which is why if somebody told you that your plane was one dimensional, that would not be a compliment. Um, so now moving on to two dimensional. Now, actually we can do quite a bit with two dimensional sound. Um, if you think about, um, at least to a point, um, think about a picture frame. So uh, a picture frame is two dimensional. It has a length, it has a width, and but it has no depth or at least to speak of if it, you know, okay, technically it would have this much, but, or a wall, you know, we're, we're talking about geometric uh, figures like a square, a triangle, a circle, a pentagon, all those things are two dimensional. And because of course, if a square becomes three dimensional, then it's a cube. So um, in sound, that would be like, what if I played our, uh, uh, our favorite Schubert arpeggioni, the opening in two dimensional sound, well, it might be something like this. something like that before. Um, there are good things about it, but um, there's also a lot to be desired. Um, and uh, so now we want to talk about three-dimensional uh, 
sound in, or interpretation uh, and in music. And the three dimensional is going to have a lot more shapes and contours, which is um, related to the diagonal direction of things in music. What I just played was very upright and stiff because it had the vertical and the horizontal and not much else. Um, but with three dimensional, we have we get into the, the where the colors are in music, the uh, dynamics, uh, articulations, the the and the finer things, um, the different feeling of pulse. Like you notice in that two dimensional version, it sounds like I'm counting because I was. I wasn't feeling anything really. It was two dimensional in a way, very wooden. Now, if I uh, play the same thing in three dimensional sound. there's a lot more flexibility, uh, more dimension to the sound, and it's moving along with a pulse, which is generally, it's in a tempo, but if I put a metronome to it, I bet anything it wouldn't be perfect. And that's intentional, and that's actually uh, a good thing, as long as, you know, we're not going all over the spectrum, you know, but within a, a few clicks. That's a positive thing. So, um, okay, so that's, we talked about one dimensional, two dimensional, three dimensional, both in the physical world and the musical world. And now we ask why 3D sound? Um, well, I think we've already addressed some of those things, but um, we should also mention other things in support of that, the history of Western music, uh, classical music, um, was always about emulating the natural world and emulating uh, humans and the human voice. Invented to emulate singing, the human voice and everything the human voice does. And of course, when we listen to a singer, they have to breathe when they play and they have to uh, push, you know, uh, up to the high notes, which takes milliseconds more time than say a half step or a whole step. Um, and, uh, and so this is uh, of course, very much in support of 3D sound. Now also, um, in the, we should talk about practically, like if you're preparing for an audition or um, a competition, um, you know, people want to hear something special and um, the people who really stand out are usually people doing things with three-dimensional sound because that's where the essence and the life of music is. That's where the depth of expression is, just like in the physical world, that's where the depth is. So um, now I thought I would um, maybe uh, take a few musical examples and show you uh, 2D versus 3D. You already heard the Schubert, but maybe we could do it in a way where I'm actually working on something. So um, I thought I would take the slow movement from Chopin's cello sonata um, because uh, this style of playing would very much depend heavily on, on 3D sound. And so of course, if I played the opening theme there in 2D, it would probably be something like this. <laughs> which leaves a lot to be desired. Again, it's, it almost sounds like a march or something like that. Um, but if we apply 3D to that. to play it pretty well and so maybe I mean there's definitely things we can do better but 
Um, I jumped ahead of myself maybe a little bit. But anyway, what I want you to notice is a few things. First of all, um, when we're looking to, okay, we can look at what I did the first time versus what I did the second time. So the first time, like every beat felt the same. And that's already a problem because it's in what? Three, two, right? So um, the second beat in a bar should feel different than the first bar, uh, first beat. And the third beat should feel different than the other two as well. So like, la, la, da, da, di, di, da, da. although this is a little bit of a trick because it's a hemiola over two bars. But nevertheless, um, uh, it needs to have each beat should feel different. And what dictates that is the harmonic progression. So we have. Um, so those are the notes. Um, but then we also have to, well, it's like, okay, fine, I'll design it, but should I just design it any way I feel like it? Or, well, the answer to that is yes and no, because you should, but at the same time, you should, um, we, there are some facts to take into consideration. So when I'm phrasing something, of course, you know, things are moving to the dominant. So that would be the first thing to look for. Um, and we have sort of a tune today, but um, we have sort of a, a, a play go there. Um, and then also we can look to linguistics. So we know in, you don't have to speak Polish, the language in which Chopin uh, spoke, to be able to play Polish music, but you just need to know uh, a few key things. And one would be, so where is the stress in the Polish language? And it's on the penultimate syllable of the, the phrase in language. And so in music, it's going to apply uh, very similar uh, in the same way. So that if I, I want to make sure that I'm building the musical tension in my shaping, uh, through that line, I want to make sure that the line goes to that penultimate harmony, and I can shape it however I want getting there, but the, the overall the musical intensity is going there. Okay, so fine. And then, okay, so it sounds good and it's fine, but let's say, well, we want the expression to be even more specific. So what else can we look at um, that would be related to three-dimensional sound. Um, we can look at trying to figure out what is this movement. And, you know, if I've learned my part and I play it well, that's great, but um, they'll reach a point where I need more than that. And of course, with the harmony, where is that to be found? It's in the piano part, right? And so you need to look at the entire uh, picture the entire score of what's going on in the music so we look at the piano part and we see this um, line on the left hand uh, and so on and so this is a very beautiful um, rolling circular feel to the left hand and then you're scratching your head, you're like, geez, that sounds familiar. What other pieces uh, did Chopin write that have a figure like that in the left hand? And if you look around um, in through the literature, you'll find that uh, there are nocturnes that he wrote like this, like with his Opus 20, you know, the famous the tune of course but then the left hand and so on goes on and so yes it's, we see it's the same type of figure so I think it's safe to 
presume that this slow movement is indeed nocturnal. And so what does that mean? It means that the, the pulse, what, you know, uh, I'm gonna get to that a little bit later, but um, you know, Brahms himself talked about music having a pulse like a heartbeat. And as we know, a heartbeat, uh, your, your heart when you're at rest is generally at a certain speed, but there are all kinds of fluctuations. And of course, if you get excited, it goes much faster. Um, when you're sleeping, it goes a little slower. So according to what you're doing and, and um, how you feel, your, uh, of course, your exercise is going to go very fast. So um, we, uh, music is the same, it has a heartbeat. And so when we're looking at a piece like this, and now we know it's nocturnal. So at least whatever's going on in the piece, at least we know the backdrop is, is at night. And not always, sometimes there are severe storms, but at night, generally things are calmer. And so what would that mean? Then how would you apply that? Well, probably the heartbeat is going to be a little calmer because it's in the night. Doesn't mean it, that doesn't mean it doesn't have a lot of expression or intensity because you can feel very intense uh, emotions or, or sharp thoughts, of course, in the night if you're awake um, or if you have vivid dreams. But it just means that the background needs to be, we need to at least start in something calmer. So that's why when we play this, I know it says mezzo forte, but it's a nocturnal mezzo forte. So like I played before, I, I'll just play a little again. <sighs> sounds like it's perhaps in a silver moonlight or something like that. So again, I, and I'm, I was using, I'm playing with, with of course, a very expressive um, legato, but at the same time, um, the feeling is, has a very soft pulse to it. So that's um, some ways or, or certain aspects in a real example about 3D sound. Um, now I thought maybe I would uh, talk about the actual uh, mechanics of 3D sound. Um, and um, in order to do that, um, let me just set my instrument down for a minute because I'm going to need to stand up and just to demonstrate a couple of things. So the first thing is what I just talked about, actually, it's the pulse. And the pulse, um, and so how do, how do we practice the pulse? Well, I think first of all, with your body, and you're going to see, you're not going to see my head, but that's okay for right now. So one of the things you can do is you can stand up and then bend your knees slightly like so, and then just simply shift your weight onto your right foot and feel that, and then shift your weight onto your left foot and feel that. Okay, so we feel the transfer of weight and balance from leg to leg, and now I'm going to bend my knees and feel, I just randomly picked this pulse. And so I'm doing this like so, so I can feel the beat in my knees and in my feet and my body. And then if I pick up my head, I can compress myself like this. Now I want you then to take that and I'll transfer it to sitting down. And another, a great way to feel this as well would be to take uh, a yoga ball and um, just to feel the spring up and down on that because this is the type of uh, ways because we physically need to feel and prepare um, what we do or else the music can't possibly sound three-dimensional. So, because everything, every motion requires a preparation and it starts with this pulse. So even when I start doing this, I don't just suddenly go and slump like this. No, I lift myself up or pick my head up and then I feel this springing motion in a tempo. So this is um, just real basic, but um, it's helpful. Also, um, if you know we're taught to have our feet flat on the ground, which is a great place to start for sound, but sometimes if we have slight variations in that, it can release tension in the lower body and, and help flexibility as long as we still feel the ground on our feet. So, um, so this is good. And then now we can um, uh, take that 
and apply it to something with the cello. So some, let's say something like a scale. And if I have to pick up my cello and go over here, and what I will do now is start a scale with pulse. And, and a way we can start is to make do it with audible pulse. So if I do something a little extreme, you can hear it in the sound like this. And of course, that's not very musical and it's more just, <laughs> it's very, uh, we could say more primitive, but it's just to just feel the pulse and make sure that it's, you know, things are working. And then once you have that, then you can do it pick up your arm and, and these things become very small and much less visible so that so on so I, I feel that and then when you play of course it gets even less visible than that so, but this is important because I'm not counting, I'm feeling the, the beat. And, and then this can be, of course, uh, applied in uh, so many different ways to music. Um, great. Now let's, uh, we, okay, we talked about the body and just generally preparing yourself. Now let's look at the right side, the, the bow and what the bow arm does. Um, of course, with beginners, um, it's always about, you know, catching the string and then drumming the sound, which is, uh, you know, very important and key to, you know, if you don't have, you aren't making a good sound, it won't matter what else you do because you won't have the, the tangible means to communicate. Um, and then for more advanced players, I would say with a preparation, catch the string. And then of course with the pulse. And, and this is a legato stroke I'm doing. And, and legato is kind of like, um, if, if a really smooth attack, it's kind of like landing a plane on a runway. And if I do that, it, it's smooth entrance. And also it feels like you're joining something that has already been going in motion. So if it, so, where is this useful? Well, let's, what about the second movement of Tchaikovsky's Sixth Symphony? So if I start. So as I began, uh, I joined from somewhere. I didn't go. So again, this is an example of, of how you can use this and, and what I'm doing is it comes, of course, from the pendulum swing and that needs a preparation. So you don't, the pendulum doesn't just suddenly go like this. If you're playing baseball, you don't suddenly throw the ball like that or else it would just go right into the ground. But so you have to have a preparation and then a rhythm to that. And the same is true, of course, when you're playing an instrument since it is also in addition to the sake of music, it's a physical activity. Um, and then of course you can do this with non legato too. Um, and for beginners there, it's usually catch the string, release and catch it again, this type of thing. And for the more advanced players, it's um, catching the string. You, you start near the string, but then it's about the feeling of the pulse. And then also the, the, the release or the change of feeling. So like if I didn't release my forearm and did that, I'd get something pretty stiff. But if I prepare with the feeling, then I get you know strokes, good strokes, and there's a release. And then that release is the preparation for the next one and, and, and so on, it keeps going. Um, you know, literally last night here in Cleveland, we played Haydn's Symphony Number no. 70. And the first movement, um, again, if, if I wanted to play 
the opening in the cello part in 2D, it would be something like this. <laughs> Now, if I breathe, if I feel the beat, and you know, head to toe, and am involved. Yeah. So then, there's a there's a lot more possibilities musically. Uh, great. And now with the left side, um, you know, the sound production is very important in the fingers to be balanced the touch of the fingers. And um, generally speaking, I see better work being done in this department than probably ever before. Um, and intonation is at an all time high and these types of things. But um, something that isn't spoken about very much is feeling uh, gesture and direction uh, on the left side. And even in a position like this or this, something like this, um, and, and so I could feel the gesture forward, backwards, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One is the transfer of weight from lower to higher finger like this. And, and then my motion isn't going to be that big either, because if it's big, then you're going to start changing the angle at which the fingers intersect the strings. And that's going to compromise the intonation, of course. But there is as with everything we do, there's a range of motion. So I can do this much and really not change uh, what my fingers are doing. So I can feel this way. I, I exaggerate, of course, so you can see it, but in actual practice, it's very small. And so, so this is important again. So if I played, um, I don't know, anything, if I just, um, there's three notes, if I did like, <laughs> down well that's the kind of with an up and down feeling but if i did um with that gesture and preparation just like on the right side let's say it became more legato and probably that's playing a beautiful legato is one of the more uh higher things technically to um to strive for because it's easy in a way to to play kind of uh percussive um but but you notice I did something with my left elbow when I started. I picked it up with the tempo and with the feeling of the pulse. And so, okay, well, how could we practice that? Well, you know, um, probably one thing that's useful at first is just like just tapping the finger just to feel what that is or each finger you can try pushing the strings down or just even lightly on the surface. So fine, okay, you did that and now you can uh, try with, so hang the hand and do the chicken flap. And so I'm going to pick a tempo and then start flapping my wing like this. And the idea here too, again, there's a range of motion. If, I, if I'm to feel just this little bit of buoyancy when you're playing on the left side and to have to release the tension, because then, of course, if I'm too big, I start lifting my shoulder off the saga. We don't want that. If I go down, we start straining the, the muscles on the side of the body. We don't want that. But we want to be buoyant because if we're frozen on the left side, then the only way we can move up and down the fingerboard is basically through a jerky motion without a preparation. So we want to avoid that. Instead, feel this regularity of motion as we move up and down and feel gestures um, so, so here we're doing this. And then the next thing would be to combine the tapping with the arm motion. So, and, and so this is adding a component to otherwise, you know, great use of the fingers, which so many people do so well. Um, but this kind of thing, and, and as you saw when I just played three notes, it, that preparation gave um, immediately uh, a, a totally different feel to what that was doing. And, and, and that's really the point. And then on both sides, you know, you can have lively feeling of pulse and applying like this, or you can do or softer, gentler. It's, it's the gentler pulse, pulses like so that are, um, 
probably the harder ones or, or the ones that need more um, practice so that they're accurate but have a certain feel, but, but also quickness because cello is um, probably not one of the faster instruments since it's on the lower end of the sound spectrum and it's a sizable instrument. And so, um, so to be able to do, make sharp attacks and have quick motions is also very important. And in the orchestra, of course, it's useful because those violins over there can make a sound much easier when it comes to speed than we can. So we have to be a little bit sharper and better at that. Um, okay, great. Um, now let's move on to breathing. Now I, I could go into to length about breathing, but basically if I'm playing a scale, here I'm breathing with the bow and that keeps the sound spinning. If, if I breathe, let's say I breathe, but the sound. It's moving, but it's not as good as if I'm and next time I'll use an instrument I've actually been playing. <laughs> see how that when it's coordinated with the bow that it's much more expansive the tone is fuller now what if i and to show you the relationship so let's say um my um to make if i don't have any blocks if i'm not tight you know forearm upper arm shoulder if it's loose enough then um then this should work so if i start breathing Stop breathing. The bow should stop. And because there, there really can be a direct relationship. And now it doesn't mean every single bow stroke, everything has to be coordinated. But in general, we end up breathing with the phrase, the musical line. And a lot of times, if it's melodic, it's going to follow the bow as I spoke about before. Another thing that's important in making 3D sound is the anticipation and connection that you need between bow strokes. Again, a scale, so let's say three pulses to a bow. On the third one, I should already feel the upbow. How to keep the legato going now of course i can also make the pulses a little smaller i'm just get out of demonstration mode such a smooth bow change. So sometimes that just anticipating less and get any sort of accent or emphasis you want. Um, so that's how, I, and another thing I wanted to mention really quickly about breathing, and that's when I'm starting something with this preparation, if I take a breath like you should, and if I exhale with the note, going to get more of a harder consonance on the front. But if I exhale before I play, you get a softer consonant. So these are tools that you can use with the breath. Um, and, and of course, if you get, you know, nervous or you're getting, feel yourself getting tight, sometimes just a big exhale and play just to kind of let everything go is a great thing to do too, um, so that it doesn't have to always be so you, so you don't get so busy upstairs trying to work it when you when you do anyway working on something like this. Um, and um, okay, great. 
So, um, and then the last thing I wanted to just briefly touch on with 3D sound is um, the projected directions that you can play with. You know, two dimensional is, as we said, you know, like a picture frame on the wall, flat. Um, and so if I play, let's say the slow movement to hide in D, Making my point, it sounds flat like something on the wall. And also, I'm always playing straight ahead. So I'm, it's like everything I play is just direct, one direction. Um, if it's three dimensional, what would happen if I played that opening? Let's say I start playing this direction. And then I play this direction. And then I invite everybody in to my house. So those are ways in which you can, uh, you know, like try to employ different uh, planes or, or spheres, directions in your music. Sometimes it can go this way, this way. What if it was behind you? Reference to an 80s TV show, The Twilight Zone. And so that would be thinking about seven o'clock, <laughs> who's creeping up behind me or what's going on in the shadows behind me. So anyway, um, I hope this is um, informative in terms of the many different sort of technical and also um, musical ways to think about changing two-dimensional sound into three-dimensional sound. And I think it's just such an important topic because all of the finer things, all of the deeper meaning of music uh, is most effectively expressed through three-dimensional sound. So um, anyway, I want to thank all of you for joining us today. And I think it's time now to take some questions. So I will put my cello down and I will look at my phone and see what is coming. Oh, somebody is disagreeing. Well, that's good. We always need to have um, uh, different opinions that are welcomed. Comment from William Schultz. I don't know if I would agree with that definition of 3D sound. It seems to me that acoustics would determine more of a 3D component an interpretation of the musical line. Well, I will say th there's two things going. I was referring to two things and perhaps I could have explained it more clearly, but um, sound itself is three dimensional. But in uh, interpretively, um, the, today's session was mostly about interpretation, making 3D, 3D sound through interpretation because it's only possible really to make 3D, uh, uh, 3D music making maybe it would be the best way to uh, describe it because sound is always three-dimensional unless it's compressed onto digital files or, or means of you know, recordings. But in, in live time, it's always three-dimensional. But we're talking about um, making 3D music and that's where this is really an important subject because if you aren't uh, interpreting things, music lies between the notes, the, the, the highest forms of it, expression because after all music, what is it? Organized sound, that's what it is. And so this is, um, it's really important how we connect the notes because it makes the difference between, you know, uh, basic level music making and, and something that might approach art. So, um, uh, but anyway, I, I appreciate the, the, the remark. Question from Jonathan, can you discuss the process of integrating 3D sound with developing your personal sound, sound character. Well, yes, um, that, and that's where the fun lies. I mean, it's not, it's not always fun to work on your intonation. It's not always fun to work on, um, you know, playing in time and those types of things. But in terms of your personal sound, um, absolutely. Because the mo you know, basically physics tells us any motion we make or prepare, that's what it's gonna sound like. But that also means 
how you, um, the, the emotional state that you're in and, and, what, and, and that's part of the feeling. So the art of playing a string instrument is really um, matching, uh, finding the physical gestures that match what you hear in your ear and want to come out of your instrument. And, and when you do that, uh, the more uh, consistently you do that, that's power and that makes, um, yeah, that, that there's nothing in a way more rewarding as a musician than to hear coming out of your instrument what you heard in your head. I mean, that's the greatest thing ever, right? Um, and so the process, well, these technical things I talked about, these are tools, but then ultimately, um, you know, they say the greatest, um, the, uh, the, the greatest performance is when performers are in the zone. Basically what they're doing is they're listening. There aren't too many thoughts going through their head and they listen and feel with the motions that they practiced, but they do it in live time, um, meaning like you're playing it for the first time, like you're reading it. So it's it's prepared, but it's spontaneous at the same time. That's that's usually when the best um, results will come. Question from Peter: How does one think of practice three D sound when working on orchestral excerpts, especially in thicker textures such as music? of Strauss and so on. You know, um, one thing to remember about orchestral excerpts is it's still music. And what I mean by that is sometimes we get, we box ourselves in because we're like, oh, it has to be this and it has to be that. And it, it can't, you know, it has to be in time or else. Well, yes, all those things are true. And yes, there is definitely more of an orchestral component to an orchestral excerpt. But at the same time, I would approach it the way you would approach anything else. And, and when I say orchestral component, what I, yeah, I mean, what I'm referring to um, is to put you in orchestra, you play generally in, in a sense broader so that other people can play with you. And then of course, precision of time. But I would think of precision of time as being pulse still. It's just, and depending on what, but okay, it's probably a little more strict and then it would be if you played your solo piece. But I think um, it's much more liberating and you're, you'll get a, uh, a more interesting result if you just come at it first from what you want to do musically and then you can sort of, you know, adjust it to be more um, uh, quote unquote orchestral. Um, but very good question. Uh, and, and one thing I'll say about Strauss, yeah, yeah thicker textures. Um, well, yes, there are a lot of fixed uh, textures in Strauss, but keep in mind, Strauss himself said he wanted his music to be played like Mozart. So the best Strauss I've ever heard um, also has a transparency so that even when it is dense like that, everything can be heard and it's not just kind of a, a lion <laughs> coming at you. Of course, in the climactic moments, there are always things like that, which are even necessary for because of the overall effect, but good question. Uh, Jacob, how does one utilize 3D sound to get quickly acclimated to playing in different halls under pressure stress? Well, that's good. Um, you know, um, well, your 3D sound will already be there because it's it, by the time you get to a concert or a audition, I mean, you're already, uh, you know, it's a finished product, right? Or, or, or hopefully, <laughs> I mean, there are times, but generally it's a finished product. And so when you get there, um, that's going to be, uh, it's in, in the interpretation. I think what's important in a hall is, you know, I, I know a lot of people don't, but if you're walking into a hall for an audition, tune your, your instrument, play, just play a few open strings just to hear what that sound does and, and, and how the timing. And then you play like you practiced, but yeah, you try to, um, figure out the acoustics of, of the space you're in and and if there's a if it's really reverberant you might take a slightly conservative tempo if it's if it's really dry you probably just play it the way you play it because you're probably not gonna try to play it faster in an audition because things are already going pretty fast but that's that's a very good question okay michelle says um could you describe the motion of the bow arm when playing whole bows i find it difficult to retain a natural motion and find that it requires much more attention. Yeah, you know, one thing um, I was covering a lot of ground in a short time. Um, 
you know, when, when of course, when a, the beginner starts, they pull the bow straight, right? You, you put the bow down and then you pull the sound. But have, if you look at the shape of the bow, of course, it's, it's concave, the modern bow, uh, since uh, Tort invented it. And so it makes sense then if, you know, if we come at the string from in an, in an arch like this, physics is going to push it straight anyway. And then you're going to get more shape to it. But, but you're talking about um, uh, maintaining the natural motion. Well, OK, one really important thing is that you're not holding the bow too tightly because then if, if you have the same feeling in your arm and all parts of the bow, that means there's too much contact or squeezing or, or somewhere too much tension. So ideally you want to have that weight released into the string, but you want to feel uh, that the feeling of the arm changing in all in different parts of the bow. And that change through physical sensation and, and also will help you feel more, you know, it's, it's like doing the front crawl, but off to the side. It's like a swimming motion for legato we're talking about. Good question. Uh, here's another one. Really enjoyed the, this perspective. Uh, discovering one sound is such a personal journey and you've discussed so many great tools. Um, my pleasure. You know, one thing I, I will say, um, discovering, one's personal voice and especially at a young age is essential it's absolutely you must yes find your voice and from there other things are possible but then as you're learning about music um you need to also be thinking about the sound world of each composer and search and, and maybe you know it, it's not that it's just one thing but generally and then also even more interestingly what sounds can you use to express what? Um, you know, like we talked about the nocturne. Well, I was a little in the Chopin, I was a little more suspended and, um, and I had a, a, a little suspended in my arm and had a little bit more of a veiled sound to create that nocturnal quality. Um, how long did it take me to land the job with the Cleveland Orchestra? Well, how many auditions? Well, um, only thing I'll say about that is I, I didn't take the normal route uh, to a lot of um, orchestral auditions. Um, I, I, I didn't, I took some, I, I wasn't except, I wasn't hired everywhere. Um, I, I tried out in a few places that um, <laughs> one place I was sort of caught between a political situation where conductor wanted me and the musicians didn't want anything the conductor wanted it was in Europe and so that didn't work out and so and then another time I, I played for um, a cello section and they they didn't um, they didn't uh, invite me to come or encourage me to come audition I played a great audition but I just figured I wasn't the right one for them um, and and of course I, I started my career playing or orchestra career anyway playing as solo cellist in Bamberg and and um, that was, I, I took the audition and everything, but it, it was nice that I played with them as a guest principal before the audition. And then I, they were, that's a more of a European way and they were trying out principals. And so that was helpful because I did well there. And so that it's, it's nice if, you know, to be in a good light when you come into audition. But um, in terms of taking on audition, I, I encourage people to reach out to members of orchestras um, you may not get, you know, a response from everybody all the time, but um, people like it if you are interested in their work, if you're, if you're genuinely interested in uh, what, you know, as students, I know I wasn't one to, I, I didn't want to bother people sometimes, and I, I mean, I, I did ask questions, but I, but, you know, as a later, as a teacher, I realized, no, actually, people like it if you're, <laughs> if you're interested in what they're doing, and, and they're happy to often, you know, share kernels of wisdom with you. So, um, so yeah, don't be afraid to, to reach out to people before an audition, you know, come take, play for them, take a lesson, whatever. Um, uh, just because it, it helps you know better what that ensemble is about and it helps them know a little bit about you. It's, it's not, you know, it can only be a good thing, I think. Um, Paula says, in what ways does playing in a professional orchestra differ from your work in chamber music? Uh, do you approach orchestral and chamber repertoire differently? 
Well, um, I think, you know, as in a, in an orchestra, it's, it's a complex question because if you're the principal or the associate principal or in the middle of the section or in the back of the section, you might play differently, you know, according to what's, it should, the balance in a section should always be changing. So, um, yeah, I think about it when I'm practicing, like in a place where, um, you know, I need to put step and uh, take a good step forward and, and really lead my section assertively, or in a place where maybe we want to hear expressively things coming from the back. And, um, and also, of course, in orchestra, if, you know, especially if it's your chief conductor, your music director, I might be thinking, well, how is, how do I think he's going to approach this? Because then I won't be wasting my time preparing something that'll never be used. Um, and so, right, so there's these types of thought processes that accompany my own work. In chamber music, um, yeah, it's more about, you know, if it's a string quartet, it's four individual voices. Right? You're not blending with anybody, you're carrying a line yourself. And so it's, it's more about, you know, individual personalities collaborating together. And so, so I, right, I might have a slightly different mindset for chamber music. I mean, of course, music is music at the end of the day, but these are of, uh, real and uh, distinct differences in, in, the, in the type of playing. Uh, very good question. Um, Lee says, would you please share a bit of Janos Starker's personality and his approach with his students? Well, Janos Starker had a very dry, dry sense of humor. Um, he, he could be incredibly funny. Um, he loved to talk about what everyone else was doing and, and, and he loved to fall and, and to share that with other people. Um, he could be sarcastic. Uh, sometimes uh, when I was there most often in a, in a humorous way, uh, uh, once in a while, if he was upset, <laughs> got a little cold in the room, but, <laughs> but generally speaking, um, he, was, he was a wonderful personality. Um, uh, uh, and, and of course, so, and, and he was an incredibly loyal also to his students in terms of supporting them and, um, and telling them the truth. And sometimes, uh, I mean, there were some people it could be, uh, it would be harsh, definitely by modern standards. Um, and he really, he really sized people up uh, by character. He was more interested in people's character than your ability. It was, if you're, if you're hungry and willing to learn, he would, he would definitely be supportive of what you're doing. If he sensed that you didn't necessarily want to follow his line of instruction, well, then maybe it could have been a, a little more difficult <laughs> experience. So anyway, good, uh, happy to share that question from Christian. Do you have a different mindset regarding 3D sound in terms of articulation clarity in a recording set setting? Um, you know, uh, the main difference between recording and uh, playing a concert is in a concert, if there's some grit and, you know, some less desirable things that go by, it's, it filters out in the hall and it's not such an issue. With a microphone three feet from you or whatever, you tend to hear the details. So in, uh, or these imperfections more, um, it's at the same time, it's, it's good not to get hung up on those things when you're actually recording because then you'll, you'll likely make more. <laughs> so um, I would recommend, uh, you know, it's, it's, I would just say probably recording is a little bit more, um, yeah, you just need to just kind of zero in. Be, you're, you'll probably be slightly more collected in your approach, but not at the expense of not doing what you need to do. Um, and, and, but on the other hand, I mean, that's one way to go about it. And especially if you only have like one crack at it, but um, also sometimes it helps to, oh, you know what I should say, and I've seen it a lot, um, well, we, we do it a lot in, in the, this is with the orchestra is oftentimes, you know, we, we put these, we're putting these um, Adela videos together right now. And oftentimes the first performance is a little slightly, just a little more collected, like I talked about. And then in the second night, you might let things fly a little bit more because most everything has already been 
covered well the first night. Um, if you're recording in chamber music or a solo piece, I mean, you can, you can play it as many times as you want, but the problem is you only have, usually have so much gas in the tank each day. But anyway, great question. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. Oh, but you want, and you want an um, articulation clarity uh, in recording that would be acoustics. Um, paying attention to that. A uh, question from Jay, how do you deal with anxiety while playing big solos or concertos? Um, you know what I recommend for that? I, I, if, you're, if you're feeling uncomfortable or something, um, try to get uncomfortable ahead of time enough. Because if you are, you'll start working earlier and you'll know your stuff better. And when you get to the, one of the ways to overcome it is just know everything better than you would normally know it to the point where you know everything in the score or for the most part and, and you just you've done this you know so many times and 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 it's just really ingrained in you i think that's one of the best ways to be confident is just to have a superior product although sometimes there are um, things that um, you know prevent you from you know if you can you feel uncomfortable uh, you might not play as well as you want to um, and for those things, um, I think it's good in your practice to, to really focus on being positive and especially um, when you're for everything, but then in the expression and everything too. And if you find the negative stuff, I mean, if you don't have time, sometimes you just have to power through, you only have 15 minutes. But if you, if you have the luxury, and sometimes even if you do have 20 minutes, stop playing for even five minutes check your phone, talk to a friend, read something, step outside, just do, do something else, clear your head, break that train of thought, and then come back to your instrument and put uh, and, and start with the type of, you know, thinking that, that you wanted to, you know, thinking of places um, that make you comfortable or any sort of thought that brings positive thoughts and feelings and, and makes you you know, more calm. Um, so those are the types of things. And then you also have to remind yourself if you're a little uncomfortable, uh, well, what the great Gregor Piatigorsky said, he always said, if you want to be comfortable, why don't you go home and go to bed? So in other words, it's natural, it's normal to feel a little bit anxious before a concert. And so there's nothing wrong with you. Um, how has your perspective as a musician and artist changed throughout your career? Well, sure. Um, I, I think when I was younger, um, I just, you know, I just, I just loved music. I enjoyed it, and and it felt very much about me. And um, and of course, um, it still is as a performer. It has to to some extent. But I think what developed a lot over the years is to the just the idea of me being some sort of transmission tower or what I'm trying to transmit from the composer to the best of my knowledge what I think they wanted or might might approve of or something that is, is within the realm of you know the facts that what we know about that composition and to try to 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 express that in the most effective way to the listener, and, and that to me um, is is really empowering and exciting because if I think of myself as just somebody, you know, communicating something, sharing something that's really great and out there, instead of you know, this is about me and you know, and all my faults and everything, <laughs> it kind of takes the pressure off too. Um, so that's good. Um, Great. Well, um, you guys have been, uh, these are really great questions, and it's been a wonderful uh, afternoon or an hour here um, talking to you about 3D sound. Um, go take some of these things, think about it, see um, what you're doing in your work. If you, you know, many of you may very well already be playing with 3D sound. And so, um, but to kind of use these tools and, and or ways of thinking about uh, musical interpretation and, and, and how, to, how you can use these expressive and technical tools to up your game. So thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.